Good morning, everybody. My name is Phil Davis. I'm the Workforce Service Director for Job Service North Dakota. Pat Burton only was originally scheduled to be your host today, but I'll be stepping in for Pat as he is not available due to a death in his family. Our thoughts and prayers are with Pat during this time. However, I'm excited to be your host, and I want to thank all of you for joining us for our webinar, Breaking Barriers, Hiring Justice Involved Individuals. But before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items to cover. We have muted the chat and microphones during this webinar to provide you with the best experience. If time allows, upon conclusion of our presentations, we will open the chat for your questions and comments. We will also be providing an email address at the end where you can submit your questions and comments in that format. Over the course of the next week or so, we will summarize all questions and answers and will distribute the information to all participants attending today's session. Although we are recording our webinar today, SHRM recertification credits will only be available to those attending our live webinar. We'll be sharing that code soon for all in attendance today. Now, last year, we provided three webinars to our employer audience, and we are excited to be with you here today and bring you our first webinar of 2024. As the state's designated workforce agency, we bring employers and job seekers together. We are always seeking innovative ideas to bring to our employers, and these webinars are just one of those tools to help you. Our past webinars have focused on work-based learning, the hiring of international students, and labor market information. If you missed any of our previous webinars, you can view them on our main jobsnd.com website under the employer resource section. Please give them a look. Now, as you probably know, our September labor market continues to show a high number of open positions. Although our state job openings have slightly decreased over the last couple of months, finding the right talent for these open jobs continues to be a challenge for many employers. Our webinar today offers insight into an untapped labor pool to help fill these open positions. If you joined early, you saw that one in three individuals has a criminal record. Yet despite the growing need for employers to fill open positions, applicants with a criminal background often face huge obstacles to achieving gainful employment. The negative effects of a conviction rarely end when a person has completed their criminal sentence. The consequences of a conviction can make it all but impossible for some people with criminal records to try to rebuild their lives. It affects everything, but no area is more impacted than the ability to find and retain meaningful employment. In our effort to work as one as a state and align ourselves with people who wanna make a difference in this world, we brought together a panel of subject matter experts. Now, we do have one change in our lineup today that I must point out, and that is Mr. Nathan Swihovic, the North Dakota Labor Commissioner, had to cancel at the last minute. So unfortunately, he won't be joining us. However, we have a great lineup today, and I hope you, when you registered, you took time uh, to read their bios, as I think you will find they are not only knowledgeable about the topics they were presenting on, but these are compassionate people working every day to help others. Now, I'm excited about our first speaker today, Mr. Jay Spieler, who is the current Chief of Staff for the North Dakota Governor's Office. Jace is a Grand Forks native and proudly graduated from the North Dakota State University. He has always been passionate about community building, public service, and politics. After college, he secured an internship at the White House where he served in operations and logistics. Jace earned his Master of Public Administration at the Maxwell School at Syracuse University. Jace returned to North Dakota to teach before continuing his career in public service. He joined the Mayport CG team in Mayville, North Dakota, where he taught band and choir. Yet his passion for public service and politics remained a driving force within him. Now, coincidentally, at this juncture, Mr. Doug Burgum announced his candidacy for governor, and Jace jumped at the opportunity to join his campaign team. Under the Brigham administration, Jace has served as a policy advisor and later policy director before becoming chief of staff. As the chief of staff for, the, for Governor Burgum, Jace supports the governor's policy agenda, legislative relations, and government affairs for the state of North Dakota. Jace resides in Bismarck with his wife, Kate, and two boys. Welcome, Jace. Thank you, Phil, and good morning to everyone. Uh, thrilled to be here and to be able to kick off this great webinar about breaking barriers, hiring justice involved individuals. Uh, just as Governor Burgum would do, I'd like to start off with gratitude. Uh, gratitude begins with the great state team members who work every day to support those who are justice involved and who, who get up and really look for ways to ensure that they have the resources and support they need to re-enter the community. The second piece of gratitude goes to everyone that 
took the time to attend the call today. This is an important and timely topic, and it directly addresses one of the, the major pressing issues that the Bergman administration has been working on uh, since, since the beginning, and that's filling the over 30,000 open jobs, I should say at least 30,000 open jobs in the current labor market. North Dakota has been proactive at implementing several programs and policies that break down barriers for injustice involved individuals. Whether it's free through recovery programs that offer peer support models within our communities and prisons, ensuring comprehensive support for individuals to reintegrate and secure meaningful employment, or the Recovery Reinvented initiative that the First Lady has championed that works tirelessly to remove the stigma associated with mental health and addiction. Uh, to promote a more inclusive and understanding society. This administration has championed the Job Service Pilot Program, JP3, which you'll hear more about today on the webinar, that highlights the partnerships and the importance of giving justice-involved individuals a second chance. You know, this really started uh, through the Workforce Development Council. Uh, when the governor took office, he, he you know, reformed that council and really took on the prioritization of getting the 1,200 to 1,400 individuals that leave prison each year to get them into the workforce and create new opportunities and hope for the citizens, uh, for those citizens. We're proud to support education in prisons through various initiatives, whether it's programs like the Last Mile, bringing co coding education to residents, uh, Rough Rider Industries, and partnerships with universities and business partners that you'll hear from today that focus on vocational skills. You know, there's also access to Pell Grants, you know, to support individuals to pursue college classes, which imp improve employment outcomes upon release. Additionally, ensuring continuous access to Medicaid for those suffering from mental health disorders and addiction is critical for the reintegration and overall well being of these North Dakotans. Moreover, this administration working with DOCR uh, has had a, is establishing a new women's facility, which underscores our belief in serving women closer to their families and home communities, reflecting our commitment to family and community bonds. Today, we will explore these initiatives and hear from representatives uh, of those partner agencies, as well as forward-thinking employers who have successfully integrated justice-involved individuals into the workforce. We applaud each of you for attending today. And we also like to thank the legislative partners that we have on the call, but those that can't be here, because we know that all of these pro policies and programs couldn't be done with the support of the legislature uh, every two years. So thank you for taking the time for being here today. And we will hope that you take this opportunity to learn, engage, and ultimately make a tangible difference in our community and, and state. Appreciate you joining and for the support of North Dakota citizens who are justice involved. Thanks, Chase, for taking the time out of your busy schedule. We truly appreciate it. Uh, we also wanna thank you and the governor's office for all the support over the last almost eight years. Uh, we're definitely gonna miss you guys. Thanks, Bill. All right, our next speaker is none other than Mr. Colby Braun, the director of the North Dakota Departments of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Kobe began his career in corrections as a correctional officer in 1997. During his career, he has had the opportunity to be the warden at different facilities to include the women's prison, transitional facilities, and the state penitentiary in North Dakota. As a warden, he focused on prisoner reentry, restrictive housing reform, and incorporating more humane principles in the operations of the North Dakota prison system. In January 2024, he was appointed by Governor Burgum as a director for the North Dakota Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Recently, Colby was awarded the 2024 Charles Colson Advocate of Hope Award for his exceptional work in corrections and rehabilitation. Colby, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Phil, for that introduction, and um, thanks to the job service team for all your support um, and the work together um, as, as we focus on this very um, special topic to me. And um, and lastly, thanks to everyone in the audience for, for being on. So I'll go to the next slide. The number one priority for us in the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation is public safety. Oftentimes, people only think about law enforcement on the streets or that a person was now placed in jail or prison and believing at that point the public safety has been accomplished. 
Um, public safety is actually a lot more complex than that. It requires that person who committed that offense um, to take accountability and responsibility to the point that they are now making changes in their life and how they think and act, uh, learning new skills and being responsible back to their community. And so the Department of Corrections is comprised of, a, of almost a thousand team members serving in different capacities across the state, focusing on the public safety through our vision of healthy and productive neighbors of safe North Dakota. So as people come into come into our facilities or onto probation, our job is to really send them out better than they came in. Um, and our mission of transforming lives, influencing change, and strengthening community um, is something that we live by every day. There are more than 2,000 um, adults living inside our prison system um, across the state. We have facilities in here in Bismarck, North Dakota State Penitentiary and the Missouri River Correction Center um, in South Bismarck. We have the James River Correction Center in Jamestown. For the women, we have the Heart River Correction Center in Mandan and the Dakota Women's Correctional Center in New England. Um, our minimum custody facilities, so the Missouri River Correction Center, the Heart River Correction Center, and the Dakota Women's Correction Center all have work release programs within them. Um, and then also our partners at the reentry center. So Bismarck Transition Center and then Center Incorporated runs facilities in Grand Forks, Mandan and Fargo. And finally, we also have work release programs out of the, the jail in um, Dickinson, the Southwest Multi-County Correction Center and the Lake Region Reentry Center. So our facilities are comprised of, um, of many different facets and we'll talk a little bit more about that. We have oh, about 7,500 people who are being served in the community, either on parole, probation, or pre-trial pre services. And then finally, our youth. We have um, about 100 kids that are within the Division of Juvenile Services. And of those, we have about 30, 35 kids at the Youth Correction Center being served by that team. Next slide, please. So as Jace mentioned in his, we have about 1,200 to 1,400 people who return to the communities every year as they come to prison, they work on things and they and, and, and leave. Um, people come into these facilities generally at the lowest point. Nobody wants to be here. They've made choices that landed them here. And so our job is really to help them take accountability for their actions and then prepare them to be healthy and productive neighbors. We have met a multitude of services that we've been blessed with um, to include focusing on drug and alcohol treatment, mental health issues, a vast education program, um, and, and most recently, a lot of work with job service, really in preparing people for that employment piece. Um, so when you, when you think about prisons, oftentimes you, you drive by and you see the fences outside, you see the razor ribbon, you think about just like you see on this picture that tier of cells and, and the locks and, and different doors. Um, when when I started in corrections in '97, we were actually just part of that hardware. A lot of the training that we had is we observe, we watch, we write people up, we respond. That was it was it was different then than what, what we do today. Today we focus on the criminal thinking. So as a correctional officer, the training is focused on that, and it really makes for more meaningful opportunities for change. So we call this dynamic security um, is, the, is the, the way that we describe that now. So if we go to the next slide, each interaction with a person is really about mentoring and modeling. And so every person working in the Department of Corrections is trained to communicate effectively, enhancing the overall security of the prison. So if you think about if you know someone versus just watching someone, it really changes that experience and it really changes behavior. And you can see on the next slide that the picture of static security versus the picture of dynamic security, it looks extremely different. Um, security is best achieved when team members actively and frequently observe and interact with people in their daily life. And so rather than just observing, we're actually assessing the risks that, that person represents and how do we best work with them to improve their life. And so I always joke that, you know, North Dakota nice, but it's really North Dakota nice. And when you come into corrections and rehabilitation, there's intention behind it. And how do we help that person make change? 
normality and progression is also a couple of principles that we live by. But within those, I call normality and progression more like accountability and responsibility for yourself. So prisons, no matter how much work we do, they're always going to be an ab abnormal community. Um, in order for a person to have success at reentry, we try to normalize as much as we can. A person allowed to do their own laundry, cooking, um, or even just having a key to your room is a huge responsibility that a person gets in prison, even though we take that for granted every day. So the better that you do in your life, your choices and behavior, your work, your education, treatment, all goes into the classification system so that you then get to progress to areas within the facilities or within the prisons um, that allow you more freedom. And freedom is actually just more choice. You have choice in what you get to do um, each level that you move down through the system. And so each one of those is really about accountability and responsibility for your life. Um, ideally, from the point that a person leaves our facilities to the point that they enter our communities, the least amount of change that that person has to go through at that transition period, the better public safety is served and the better that our communities are served. Next slide, please. Um, so it took me many years in this work to recognize residents as a resource. And really what it came down to is we're never going to have enough resources in our facilities to really fix, uh, fix is the wrong word, but really help people through, through the system um, to the point because people are pretty broken when they come to us. Um, there's a lot of different issues. And so when I was warden at the penitentiary, that's when I started recognizing that the people who live there are also a resource to us. And how do we use that? And so I had to change my own mindset and actually practice what I preached to employers or to landlords who I was trying to convince to hey, hire these folks or give them a chance. And so we now have residents throughout our facilities working with other residents who need additional help. We've hired several team members who once lived here. We've now hired them as team members. And so they're state employees working with us to improve people's lives. But you can see in the pictures that whether it's a tutor or it's a peer support, so you got people with mental illness or addiction, and we also have um, caregivers. So throughout all of our facilities, we really focus on more professional, um, a professional side of what they do. And they go through very similar training that they would go through in the community. Um, even with all this work, there's, there are plenty of barriers as people leave prison. Getting an identification. If you don't have an identification, you can't find a house, you can't get employment. Transportation is difficult, especially in North Dakota. Finding housing, we've heard it, we've read it in the papers. And so these are all things that the people leaving facilities, leaving prison and re-entering our community, even with a job, there's other areas that, that are barriers. Um, so part of what we do is we actually go through simulations here to give us a better understanding of how complicated that is and how complex that is. And so it takes a community, a lot of different people to get us through to a point um, of helping these people to the point where they can succeed. During the webinar today, I hope you see how we all connect in our piece of the puzzle as people work through their life change. It doesn't come without some difficult days and most likely a little extra attention. I'm guessing we all can think back in our lives on that somebody that gave us that extra chance, that gave us that opportunity for success. Um, so I hope today you consider how can your involvement also attach to that next person's success that comes through. And finally, 97% of the people who come to prison are returning to our communities. And so when we talk about public safety and reduction in recidivism, it's really about it's an our problem, it's not their problem, and it's all of us working together, whatever different place that we represent in order to find ways to help these people succeed. So I thank you today, I thank you for being here. I thank you for taking the time to understand um, who we are, what we do, and um, if there's anything that I can do um, in my role as the director, I certainly am open um, to any conversations. So thanks again, Phil, for giving me this chance to talk today.
Phil, I'm not sure your mic's working. Bill, if you can hear me, your microphone is not working. Obviously, his mic's not working, so I'm used to these type of introductions, so needless to say, it would happen on my watch. So not a lot to tell. Maybe at the end, Phil can introduce himself uh, in uh, my bio or whatever. But my name is Rick Gardner, and I'm the director of Rough Rider Industries. So uh, uh, next slide, please. Is my mic working? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, like I said, I'm the director of Rough Ride Industries. Uh, help wanted, now hiring, join our team. <clears throat> Do those terms resonate, I guess, with a lot of people uh, on this call today? Uh, they certainly did with me. So I spent uh, the majority of my career working in the private sector. Uh, and it was constantly a struggle for me trying to find help, not only qualified help, but just help in general. Uh, it was something that actually made me leave the private sector and come to the public sector. So while here, then I was interested to find out that North Dakota hiring managers who participated in a 2018 North Dakota workforce survey indicate that company growth is limited by the inability to hire or retain qualified staff. Boy, can I relate to that. Uh, it just seemed like I was constantly struggling trying to find <clears throat> not qualified staff, but just a warm body basically to fill an open position that I had. Um, and the part that was kind of ironic about that is that North Dakota has one of the highest labor market participation rates in the nation. So the majority of our people are working and yet I struggle or companies struggle today to find help. So that drove me to the Department of Corrections. So wasn't really sure what I was getting into. Uh, had my perceptions of what prison was. So I would ask, what do you associate with prison? These are some of the things that I associate with prison. Colby kind of touched on a few of them, but uh, towers, fence, razor wire, steel bars, a real cold and harsh and punitive environment. I came to work for Rough Rider Industries. I thought, well, we're running an industries program. Maybe I'm running a chain gang. Those are the things that I associate with prison. Uh, basically, kind of what I knew about prison is what I learned from the movies, one of my all time favorites, Shawshank Redemption. And so coming to prison, wasn't really sure what I was what I was in for, but that was perception and my view of what prison was all about. So what is prison? Uh, Colby alluded to that the mission of the Department of Corrections is transforming lives, influencing change, strengthening community. Kind of crazier yet is our vision statement, a health, healthy and productive neighbors, a safe North Dakota. <clears throat> so coming from the private sector, hearing our mission and vision statement, I thought, what the heck did I get myself into? That ain't steel bars, that ain't uh, chain gangs. Uh, that 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 is the role that I had, and so, Kind of had to do a little bit of awakening, soul searching, say, well, what is this Department of Corrections all about? And how does Rough Rider fit into that? So just a little bit about Rough Rider Industries. So we were established in 1975 by the legislature. Um, our role is to instill job skills training uh, for, and help the residents when they leave prison for successful reintegration. We're self-funded in nature, so we receive no taxpayer dollars to fund our missions. Um, 
We have operations at all three of the male facilities uh, inside the walls of the North Dakota State Penitentiary, which is a maximum custody facility. We have our metal and furniture fabrications, uh, our signs. So as you drive up and down interstate and see the highway signs or the license plates on your vehicle, those are all manufactured inside uh, NDSP. And then we have a, what we call a rough stuff collections would be kind of like something like your uh, like your service awards and plaques uh, along those lines. Uh, we have our James River Correctional Center, which is located in Jamestown and is medium custody. We have sewing, upholstery, and plastic bag operations. Our upholstery would be all our, our seating offerings. And at the minimum custody down at the Missouri River Correctional Center, we have two industries, welding and sandbagging. When I say sandbagging, does that mean we let the guys take it easy? Uh, sandbagging, as you drive through any construction site, which was all over the state this year, we physically uh, fill between 45 to 55,000 sandbags a year for construction, and they use them to hold down barriers and, and signs. Uh, it's the weighted part that uh, that holds all that in place, and those are all filled down at the Missouri River Correctional Center. A little bit about our program. So we have about 170 residents enrolled with our uh, Rough Rider Industries. Uh, we're considered a preferred job. So by preferred, uh, and that would be an inside uh, prison terminology, the, we pay the highest and we pay an hourly uh, wage. And so inside prison, we are the highest paying job offered to the res residents uh, inside prison. Uh, to qualify to work for Rough Ride Industries, you have to have either a high school education or a GED. Uh, no write-ups means you can have no disciplinary actions to come out work in our way. You have to be compliant with treatment and counseling recommendations. And then security has to give that final approval. You meet all those qualifications and then you get onto a hiring list where you're called out and we interview people for our, our openings, just like you would on the outside. And then performance reviews are conducted annually. So we try to replicate just as an outside employer would. We try to replicate that as much as possible inside the prison. So when they do leave, they're very familiar with with what that looks like. The earnings, the wages that the residents make, um, a lot of it is sent home to support their family. Kind of the neat thing about that is, is so it helps offset the need for additional taxpayer public assistance programs for the families on the outside. Uh, they can use their earnings to contribute to their financial obligations, kind of they've got any fines, fees, restitution, child support. They can start paying towards that while they're in prison so they don't have such a big debt burden when they get out. And then monies are set aside before they leave prison uh, for their what we call as a release aid. So it's taken out of their check, set into a separate savings program. So when they get out, they have monies available to them for rent or insurances or or what have you when they when they do get out. So. So as Colby said, three of the barriers uh, to reentry, employment, transportation, and housing. Rough Rider Industries, although we recognize all three, we, we focus on the employment aspect of the barrier. And we've kind of broken that down into three critical areas. That would be the technical skills, soft skills, and our private partnership, enterprise partnerships. Focusing on the technical skills, which is your hard skills. Uh, hard skills, technical skills, they're easily measured and easily to, uh, easy to define. Um, some of the skills that we offer inside would be our welding, CAD, graphic design, uh, materials handling, coatings applications, sewing, upholstery, machinists, clerical, and wood and metal fabrication. Just a wide array of different technical skills, but instilling technical skills isn't going to be real helpful if we don't provide current technologies to the guys. So some of the technologies that we offer that guys work with inside would be uh, fiber and CO2 lasers, uh, thermal transfer and latex printers, CNC type equipment, and some of the latest and greatest in your CAD and graphic design software. So these technologies, so for example, when we build our furniture, we really don't want guys building furniture using a hand planer. And then when they get outside into an employer, into a furniture shop, and nobody's using hand planers anymore. So very important that 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 we instill the trade skills and are using the uh, most current technologies. We also emphasize soft skills training. So soft skills, um, they can also be designed as your people skills. Um, when I talk to employers, they say that's probably part of what they struggle with the most uh, nowadays. Uh, they'll say the trade skills, your hard skills or technical skills will open up doors, 
but it's your soft skills that keep the door open and they help secure future job openings. Uh, soft skills are something that you, uh, you don't learn in a classroom. Basically, it's something that you learn, you practice, and you prove up, improve upon throughout your whole lifetime. Some of the soft skills that we focus on would be integrity, dependability, communication, open-mindedness, teamwork, creativity, problem solving, adaptability, organization, empathy, and just a general willingness to learn. In my career, kind of going back, dependability and problem solving were two of the greatest challenges. Are they gonna show up to work and when something arises, can they figure it out themselves or do I have to hold their hands? So we work with the guys in all of these soft, uh, soft skills, hoping to turn out a completed product uh, when they decide or when they do leave prison. And then we can't forget about our private industry partners. Uh, we couldn't do our mission without them. Uh, Rough Rider Industries tries to purchase or makes an effort to purchase our raw materials from local North Dakota suppliers whenever possible. Our private enterprise or private sector partners, we rely on them to send projects or for their, their orders to come in for us to instill our job skills training. So without having projects to work on, you, we wouldn't have anything to, to have the guys to work with the technologies and learn the soft skills. We work with private enterprise to develop uh, relationships and to, and, uh, to uh, educate them on employment, transportation, housing barriers for the residents. A lot of people, when they get out of prison, employers aren't aware of some of these barriers that these guys and the challenges that they face. And if we do our job well, uh, we're hoping we turn out a finished product and our product is the people, not the, uh, not the uh, goods and services that we provide, but it's actually the people. So. Mm -hmm when they do release from prison, we're hoping that we've turned out a good product that can help with some of these labor shortage needs that uh, employers face uh, throughout North Dakota. Recidivism, so what is recidivism? Recidivism is actually a three year look back and it's a reason if a person leaves prison and they come back, we capture that data and we kind of measure that as how many left over three years and actually came back in that time frame. And how does employment how does employment fit into all that? So just some statistics here that I found very interesting. So uh, a study of the formerly incarcerated found that employment was the single most important factor in decreasing recidivism. 85 to 89% of formerly incarcerated who are rearrested are unemployed. Recidivism rates were nearly cut in half for returning citizens with a full-time job compared to similar inmates who are unemployed. Nationwide, Statewide recidivism rates range from about 31% to 70%. The North Dakota Department of Corrections recidivism rate right now sits at 37.57%. But the recidivism rates for formerly incarcerated people who found employment shortly after their release is less than 9%. And I'm happy to report that Rough Rider Industries recidivism rate, so it's a three year uh, look back of people that were enrolled in our program for six months or longer is 8.57%. So you can see the importance employment pay, plays in people not coming back to prison. Another interesting fact, so we see lower recidivism rates. So how does that benefit us as a community and as tax paying citizens? So a 2015 Washington State Institute for Public Policy study found that for every $1 invested in a correctional industries program such as Rough Rider Industries, $4.77 is saved in a reduction uh, and saved in criminal justice costs due to the reduction in recidivism. So when you can invest the dollar and get a five, almost a five times refer, uh, return on your money, uh, to me, that's a pretty wise and good investment and saves tax dollars for all of us tax paying citizens. Like I mentioned, Rough Rider Industries, we got a wide array of products and industries that we're that we are in, uh, involved in. Everything from home furniture and seating, ergonomic solutions and signs, to a little. A lot of people probably aren't aware of this, but probably 93% of the dumpsters around the state uh, are manufactured inside the North Dakota State Pen. But this is just kind of a listing here of just the different industries and uh, sampling of some of the products that we do have. Uh, so a lot of people, most businesses kind of focus in on a line or two. And, and uh, so just the different array of uh, offerings that we have 
kind of uh, makes my job very interesting. Finally, how can you help as employers? If you want to learn more about Rough Rider Industries, feel free to visit our website at www.roughriderindustries.com. You can contact Colby or myself. We'd love to give you a tour of our facilities and you, where you can actually meet the guys and see real bit rehabilitation in action. Uh, with the labor workforce struggles that businesses have, maybe Rough Rider Industries can provide help. Like I mentioned earlier, we look for projects to instill our job skills training. So maybe there's some work that we can bring in house and help your business with some of your, your uh, labor needs. And finally, I would just ask for employers out there to consider giving second chance work opportunities. Uh, if we did our job well, uh, you're going to get a should be a well polished, uh, highly skilled worker uh, that can become a taxpaying citizen and actually that can be a healthy and productive neighbor and create a safer North Dakota. And with that, thank you for letting me tell a little bit about Rough Rider Industries today. All right, thank you, Rick. Um, sorry to the audience out there, there is nothing like hosting a webinar and having your headset or hearing in your headset, no headset connected, so sorry about that. Um, I want to go back to Colby and say say thanks to Colby and to Rick for your partnership with DOCR and Job Service. Um, it's truly amazing work being done and shaping a lives that is being accomplished through Rough Rider Industries. Um, the technical and soft skills that these individuals are learning through these various programs are essential for navigating life once released. And uh, like J Rick just mentioned, I highly recommend everyone taking a tour of Rough Rider Industries. So with that tough act to follow, it is my turn to share what programs we have available here at Job Service for employers to take advantage of when considering hiring someone who is justice involved. Next slide, please. So a little bit about Job Service. If you haven't used our services in the past, or if you have used our services in the past and it's been a while or you haven't used them at all, um, a little bit about us. Our mission is meeting workforce needs uh, we provide uh, business, our business providing workforce and unemployment services. But what, what do we really do? Well, we connect employers and job seekers. And we do this through uh, various different ways, um, through our website, jobsmd.com, of course, and posting those jobs. Um, we also provide hiring events and job fairs. Um, yesterday, we had uh, what we call Talent Tuesday in our Fargo Workforce Center. And we had uh, 30 employers and 98 individuals show up looking for that next job. So if you haven't given any of those a shot, please do so. Um, we also try our best at removing barriers to employment for those individuals that come into our workforce centers Why we're here today. I think everybody knows a little bit about unemployment insurance, but kind of one of the secrets that we have here at Job Service are, is our labor market information. And you can find that information at ndlmi.com. You can find anything from area profiles. What, uh, what are the current economic conditions, uh, unemployment rates? Um, there are things like um, surveys about wages, different, uh, it's just a multitude of information. So please give that, in, uh, give that uh, website a shot. Um, who are we? Well, we like to think we're regional workforce experts. Um, just today, we are uh, hosting an event up in Grand Forks called the Northern Valley Career Expo, where we've partnered with local employers, schools, and the EDC. And we have 80 employers uh, packed into the letter center. We're going to have 2,000 students come through looking at high wage, high demand careers. So we're excited about that event today. Next slide, please. Now we have nine workforce centers across the state of North Dakota. Um, if you have not been into one of our workforce centers, please, please do so. Uh, you, you don't need uh, an appointment or anything like that. Just come on in and uh, talk to the manager, talk to the business advisor, and they will definitely help you in your hiring needs. I just wanna pause here for a minute. And these are our very talented workforce center managers that we have uh, out there. Um, I just can't say enough about what these folks bring to the job every day. And I highly suggest you get to know your local workforce center manager. Um, you can take a picture, write their number down, whatever you, you may need to do so here. But again, please, uh, please give them a call and set up a tour. Next slide. Now, before I, I get into the programs that we have, I'd just like to share my experience lately. Um, I had uh, I was invited down to the state penitentiary and Colby hit on this a little bit earlier. Um, this was uh, it was a simulation of what it's like a kind of a, 
a life in the day of, of somebody who was incarcerated and been released um, over the next 30 days. And um, we were there for most of the morning and we were, it was set up into four different, uh, four different experiences. And you had to navigate your way around um, trying to find a job, trying to find um, meeting your parole and probation officer, trying to find housing, and all these different um, stressors were put on you. And it was truly, you know, as the name applied, a simulation of what it's like being released from incarceration and then into the public. Um, so when we're talking about these things, there are de just definitely things that we can help these individuals with. And I know Colby and, and um, Rick hit on some of those. So next slide. So today I wanna to talk about our job placement uh, pilot program. I'm going to talk about the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act and how you as an employer can take uh, advantage of that. Talk a little bit about federal bonding and the work opportunity and tax credit. Our job placement pilot program, or JP3. Um, this was kind of a grassroots idea back in the summer of 2022. Uh, one of our staff came up with the idea of, hey, Phil, what, why can't we not only go into the DOCR, faci DOCR facilities and teach uh, job readiness skills, but then once they're released, why can't we continue to be more in, in, intensive on our on our case management? So we brought this idea to the Population Affairs Subcommittee of the Workforce Development Council, and, and it, you know, it caught steam. From there, it was approved and, and stamped by the governor's office, and we appreciate that. And then from there, um, we took it into the 2023 legislative session, and it was put into our budget, and then the work started. Um, again, a great partnership with the with Department of Corrections, but really, what is the primary goal? Well, it was to bridge the gap in supportive services for those re-entering citizens, re citizens to gain and maintain employment. But the why? Well, it was to access employment services, and like I've said before, in a more intensive way. It, it gave access to eligible training programs like the Workforce Inno Innovation Opportunity Act, which is one of our federal grants here at Job Service. Um, we provide individual consultation to become employment ready referrals to needed services. And the biggest part um, that you as an employer can take advantage of is, if, is we provide transportation, um, the housing, um, and we provide tools and uniforms for those individuals that you might consider hiring. So how does, how does it work? A little bit more in depth on that. Well, um, in order for an individual who is being released uh, from one of the DOCR facilities must be um, it's a handoff between their case manager to our case manager referral, and then um, they have to go through one of our uh, re readiness classes. And those readiness classes are six weeks to nine weeks in length. And again, they are taught inside of the state prisons uh, before those individuals are released. So then we go through a series of intakes. We get to know the individual. Um, we work on their employment skills. We, we uh, make sure they're job ready. Do they have a resume? How's their interview skills? Um, from there, we start the process of employment. Um, and where do they want to work? What skills do they have? And this is where you as an employer would step in. We want more employers to be involved in, in our JP3 program. So from there, we get this individual hired and we provide monitoring for up to six months. And once they have completed six months of employment, then we, they are released and they exit the program. But during that time, that monitoring, we can still continue to pay for some of those supportive services like uh, the transportation, the tools, the clothing, and that sort of thing. Next slide, please. Now here's just a little bit of update on our job placement program. Now remember, this started 1 July of 2023, and this is to date, and we've had 230 referrals from our friends at DOCR. We've completed 178 intakes. We, right now we have 72 active participants who, who over 80% of those are still employed. And of course you can see we've had 103 people exit from the program. So I think our numbers are there. We're doing really well. Um, we are taking this next uh, into the next le uh, legislative session, and we'd really like that pilot to be dropped and be more of a permit type of thing. With the expansion into the city of Grand Forks, uh, the numbers are telling us there that we do have room to expand this. So uh, any legislators uh, on our webinar today, um, please, uh, please give us some support here. I think this is a great program. So let's say you're interested in hiring somebody through the JP3 program, but you're talking to the employment advisor at job service, you're not really sure on their skills. Well, we have a program to help out with that. It's called On the Job Training, and it's part of the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. 
So you as an, as an employer can bring somebody on now, now, but the thing is they have to be, that person has to be enrolled in WIOA and there has to be a signed contract before we can uh, have the on the job training um, portion. But um, what we can do here, you provide the training as the employer and WIOA can pay up to 50% of their wage during a six, during this, the first six month period. So it's truly a win-win for everybody. Um, there's really no red tape to this. There's no huge um, contract to sign. It's just two pages, uh, one signature by the, usually the workforce center manager and a signature by you and, and off we go. Next slide. So let's say you bring somebody out from the JP3 program, you got them enrolled in WIO, we're paying up to 50% uh, of that salary for the first six months but you found out that they have some type of theft in their background. Well, we have a program for that too, to uh, help you with that and to protect your business. Um, this is a fidelity bond worth up to $5,000 and they can be applied to any job, any state, any employee, uh, it could be full-time or part-time. Um, some of the advantages, taking out, uh, no application for the job seeker, uh, nothing really for the employer to sign. It's just really a one page, uh, it might be a two page uh, questionnaire that we can help you with. And then uh, we'll put that bond in place. Next slide, please. So a couple other things to remember, again, no cost to the employer, incentive to hire a job applicant who is justice involved, $5,000 coverage um, with zero deductible, and this coverage is for the first six months of the employment. And this really lines up well with that OJT of that first six months. Um, our point of contact there is Ms. Ruth Locker at her email and her number. Next slide, please. So you have the JP3 in place, you have the OJT, uh, we have the federal bond in place. Well, here's another program that you can take advantage of. It's called the Work Opportunity and Tax Credit. And that's, this is a federal tax credit that can be applied to certain target groups, like what we're talking about today. The justice involved could be a veteran, SNAP, uh, individuals referred to us by, by our partners at Voc Rehab. Um, these credits range from $2,400 up to $9,600. Uh, more information can be found on jobsnd.com. But one thing I want to point out here is if a person is justice involved and they happen to be a veteran, that's a $9,600 qualifier. So if you're not taking advantage of this program, please do so. Uh, please look that up on our website. Next slide. So a little bit more about the WOTC. Um, it is a very popular program here at Job Service. We process over 14,000 applications per year. Um, one caveat to that, this, the paperwork must be filled out within 28 days of the new hire start date. Um, our contact there is Ms. Carmen Yonser, and you can give her a call and she'd be happy to help you. Next slide. Uh, we have some job fairs coming up that uh, I'd like to talk about. Uh, every year, we have a fair chance job fair in Bismarck, Fargo, and Grand Forks, and that's usually held the first uh, week of June. And of course, that's for those individuals that have been uh, justice involved. Maybe they're our new American population, or maybe they're, they've been working with folk rehab. They need a second or third chance. Um, we're, we're mighty proud of our virtual job fairs. We have one here uh, in two weeks, and this is a new one for us. It's called the Nationwide Veterans Virtual Job Fair. Now we are promoting that not only across the United States, but in, in 15 key military installations. We're trying to attract those veterans who are separating, and we want them here in North Dakota so they can showcase our, their skills and be part of, uh, of your businesses. If you're interested in that, uh, contact your nearest workforce center, and we can get you involved with that. And then, of course, our big one every year, and this will be our, our fourth uh, annual event, is our, our big virtual job fair, which will be held January 9th from 2025. Um, this, year we, this year, we're hoping to attract about 125 employers to that, um, and we will be, again, promoting that throughout the United States. Uh, last year, we had over 600 people attend that event from 23 states and 20 countries. So it is growing in popularity, and these, these two job fairs here are uh, conducted on our virtual platform called easy fair. Now our, my last slide today, uh, we're pretty big here at Job Service North Dakota and we're pretty proud of our, our uh, podcast called The Job Pod. Uh, we have a very talented workforce center manager, Dusty Hillebrand in Grand Forks, who um, hosts our podcast. We have uh, 70 podcasts to date with over 3,100 downloads. Um, we've held, you can see the different topics there, we have held working with justice involved in individuals. And of course, for you hunters out there, um, we just did an interview with Mr. Uh, Jeb Williams from the Game and Fish Department. Um, we just put that one online last week. 
Uh, very interesting. Uh, and again, Dusty does a great job with that. So if you and your company are interested in being on, on our podcast, um, please give myself a call or Dusty Hillebrand in the Grand Forks office. So with that, um, that's what I have today. Um, it's just a, a pleasure to be here. And, you know, I've always been proud of the work we do in helping individuals remove barriers from employment. Um, please take advantage of these programs. Um, it's just one more way we can work together to remove those barriers. So now with all the government uh, speakers out of the way, let's get to the real heart of our webinar today. Our next speaker is one of the employers who uses a couple of the programs I just mentioned. Jerry Schaff was born and raised on a farm in Morton County, North Dakota. He attended North Dakota State School of Science and acquired an associate's degree in diesel technology. Jerry owned and operated his family farm until 2000. He then moved to Mandan and started a career as a diesel technician, advancing to service manager at a local ag dealership. In 2008, he became employed with Harlow's and worked his way up to the general manager position, a position he holds today. Jerry has been married to his wife, Brenda, for over 44 years and has two sons and one daughter, along with two special grandchildren. Welcome to the stage, Jerry. Thank you, Phil, for the introduction. First, I would like to thank all of you out there for joining us today at this webinar. I would also like to thank the Governor Burgum, Jace, and their staff for providing legislations and assistance for some of the programs we talked about today. These programs not only help with reintroducing the justice-involved individuals into the workplace and society, but also aid us as employers in finding and securing additional talents for our businesses. If a lot of you are like me, we are unaware of the benefits of the programs that are available to us. When we think about the justice involved within our society, I think each and every one of us knows someone on a personal level that has been down that road. It may be a family member, coworker, friend, or may, maybe even oneself. I think if we truly look at a lot of them and analyze why they were incarcerated, a lot of them are good people that either made a bad decision, were the wrong place at the wrong time, or maybe led astray by poor influences. But not all of them were necessarily bad people. I would also venture to say if each and every one of us look back on our own life, we could see a time when we made a mistake and we're grateful someone gave us a second chance. Next slide. North Dakota is blessed with a very low unemployment rate. As an employer, one of our biggest challenges to growing our business is attracting and hiring additional staff. One of the speakers earlier mentioned today that one of company's largest expenditures is advertising for recruiting and training our workforce today and Harlow's is no different. We spend tens of thousands of dollars every year to hire and train employees. One of our most challenging positions to fill is our diesel technician positions. My fellow business managers, excuse me, my fellow business managers in this field would surely attest that we spend as much time and resources hiring help as we do to promote our services. Look through North Dakota job service listings or Bizman Online or any other job platform you will see to, to fill your diesel tech jobs or any other service related positions. Due to this challenge, we look at many different ways to overcome this. From meeting with students at the high school level to participating in career fairs, or in this case, utilizing some of the talent that has been pushed aside by society the justice involve individuals. Next slide, please. Some of the things we have done uh, to, is create a network with other business leaders to share ideas. It is interesting to visit with other business owners and managers and share creative ideas. And I welcome any one of you to reach out to me to share yours with myself and I with you. One of the things we did last year is reach out to the local high schools and ask to meet with their VOEG departments and meet with their students. I would ask the question to the students, who, who here is thinking about entering the auto or diesel programs? I would then ask them to think about the 50 to $80,000 they would likely invest over the next two years. Then propose to them, what if, what if you were given the chance to do a two-year internship at our dealership 
where you would go online, do training in an office setting, as well as apply that knowledge in our shop for those same two years. During this time, these tech trainees would be job shadowed by seasoned technicians to help guide them and teach them techniques that are gained only by experience. These students in that same two year span had the opportunity to make 50 to $80,000 instead of spending that same amount. What better way is there for a young person to better his financial future to an amount of over $100,000 in two years? Then at the end of those same two years, becoming certified, Navistar certified, and for us, hopefully found a home with us to build their career. When Job Service of North Dakota heard that I offered this type of program, they made me aware of the state and federal programs that would assist companies to do this very thing. And I asked if I would be, and they asked if I would be interested in applying this technique to the justice involved community. Next slide. I was not aware of the programs that were available through the state and federal government to aid in training and employing the justice involved individuals, which are administered through the North Dakota Job Service. Bill elaborated earlier on some of these programs, such as the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. This program is a federal program that can help employers willing to hire justice involved individuals. I think as employers, when we are initially approached by someone that has been incarcerated, for a job, our first response is to turn away rather than take the risk that they may be a repeat offender or bring chaos to the workplace. I admit that is a common fear and not every person coming from the challenged background is a fit for your company. But as you reflected earlier about someone you knew, a lot of them do deserve a second chance. And as an employer, we ask ourselves, why should we take this chance first? Most of us need to increase our labor pool. These programs we have here made it more enticing. Most of the people coming out of the transition centers or correctional facilities don't have a place to live, a car to get to and from work, or the tools we as employers commonly require our employees to provide. These programs help with that to the individuals. One of the biggest benefits of these programs for employers is having 50% of their salary paid for for up to six months while they are being trained to do the job we ask of them. As employers, we understand when we hire and train new employees, they are not always overly productive, but having 50% of their salary reimbursed surely makes them more attractive. There is also employer tax credits that Phil mentioned that can be applied for. Another benefit I had overlooked initially is their reliability. These new employees are closely monitored to attend work, to be on time, and be required to follow strict guidelines. These are imperative for any of them wanting to be released early or gain privileges. The other thing is many of them are grateful for an opportunity to get their life back on track and leave behind some of their bad choices. Please reach out to North Dakota Job Service for assistance with understanding the programs and guidance to how to navigate them. They were extremely helpful to me. Next slide. The JP3 program is a state funded program that also provides transportation to and from work, housing, rent assistance, uniforms, job readiness tools, and many other things for the justice involved individuals. Many of these individuals do not have a car or a license. These programs provide the means for these individuals to get to work and have a new start on life. But without an employer that sees value in them, most will end up back in the system again. So it is imperative that we give them the opportunity to succeed as this not only benefits them, but benefits our business and our society. This program can tie in with the Workforce Innovation Act program and provide additional assistance that may not be covered by that program and is also administered through the Job Service of North Dakota. The bigger thing of these programs is it provides employers with an untapped, underutilized labor pool. Employees that may have had learned skills prior to being incarcerated, these employees in most cases are so grateful for a second chance that they tend to go above and beyond to satisfy a new, satisfy a new employer. And tip, 
typically become very loyal to us as employers as they appreciate the opportunity. I will share a couple of success stories later of a couple of individuals we had hired a few years earlier from the Bismarck Transition Center. Without mentoring them, they would have likely ended back into the system again. I take pride in watching them transform into productive citizens and knowing that we can make a difference in their life. So I ask that you don't just offer them a job and forget about them, but mentor them, be an example for them to follow, be their friend and guide them through this transition. Next slide. Some of the benefits that uh, provided. Our company, as well as many others, require their empl employees to provide their own tools. Here is an example of the tools that were provided to the tech trainees enrolled in our programs. These tools were provided in a joint venture between the Workforce Opportunity Program and the JP3 program. These tools, upon completion of the program, are the property of the employees that were enrolled in the program. So after the initial six month program, the employee is left with the tools to continue advancing his or her career. Our industry, like a lot of others, such as electricians, plumbers, body shops, require employees to furnish their own tools. If it were not for the programs that provide these types of tools, companies like ours could not train and hire individuals to do these types of jobs, which greatly expand our labor pool. Next slide. Current program enrollees. I would like to introduce you to Antoine. Antoine came to me from the Rehabilitation Center in Mandan. Antoine was a California native that grew up amongst the gangs with the street violence and crime as a way of life. Antoine had been in and out of prison countless times, largely for possession of a firearm, which by his words were to protect himself. He was never accused of any serious crime, but the tr prison life was all he knew. Antoine is a father to a couple of young children, and he knew if he was ever to have a life with them, life had to change. Antoine decided to leave the state of California and come to North Dakota, but unfortunately his ways followed him, and he ended up being incarcerated again. Antoine enrolled at our tech trainee program just over six months ago, with the tools shown here provided to him by the JP3 program. Antoine has completed his six month program and is now a Navistar certified technician and is working on his Cummins engine certification. I mentioned earlier about taking an active role in mentoring and supporting employees that come from a troubled background and its rewards. Antoine has thanked me many times for giving him the opportunity to change his life and guide him so he can again support his children. I had an amazing moment a couple months back Antoine invited his mother out to see him and brought her to introduce me. His mom cried as she hugged me, thanking me for saving her son's life. That was a moment that would make all of my efforts to help him pay off. Next slide. Corey is another technician enrolled in my tech trainee program currently. Corey, like many other young individuals, got involved with drugs and headed down the path that led him to be incarcerated. Corey had acquired some skills prior to being incarcerated that were beneficial. Corey, like any of the individual I chose to give opportunity to, must be upfront and honest to me with their background and history. They must also show that they truly wish to change their life for the better. Corey was residing in the Bismarck Transition Center at the time he came to me. With about three months until he was available for discharge, Corey did very well. But unfortunately, after his release, he moved into an apartment and got involved again with drugs and ended up breaking parole and losing his job here. After a month of treatment following this episode, Corey approached me once more, admitting he had messed up and asked if we would give him a second chance. So Corey is now back with a deeper understanding of what is considered a second chance. Next slide. I want to share a couple of success stories um, from employer, uh, employees that we had hired a few years back. Brian came to me a few years earlier from the Bismarck Transition Center. Brian had a lot of diesel mechanic background, 
When initially interviewing Brian, it was very apparent to me Brian had motivation to turn his life around. He had moved to North Dakota from Indiana, leaving his wife and two daughters behind to chase the money in the oil field. But like many, the money and atmosphere led to drugs, which led to his incarceration. Brian worked for us for several months through his release and returned living in the private sector. But unfortunately, he too was pulled back in the use of drugs and broke his probation, landing him back in jail. Brian and I had bonded well in his time employed here and became good friends. He often shared pictures of his two daughters. Shortly after being reincarcerated, Brian's wife passed away suddenly. Not being close to anyone else here and having alienated his in-laws, Brian asked me for a huge favor. He said, I need someone to see to it my daughters are cared for. So he asked me to be his power of attorney. Yes, a big ask, especially under the circumstances. But I took on the challenge. I worked through the system, got the girls' grandparents to take temporary custody of the two girls. I cleaned up his finances and took care of his deceased wife's business. Yes, I went way above and beyond. But I knew in my heart, Brian needed this. Brian got out of the facility a few months later and was embarrassed to meet with me because he had let me down initially. But finally, he did get up the courage to face me personally. You can only imagine the tears and joy in his eyes as he thanked me for caring for his family. Today, Brian is a proud member of society. He is mending fences with his in-laws, soon to have his daughters back home living with him, and we remain good friends today, even he has taken a different career path. I am proud of him. Mark, another one of our previous employees, came from the Bismarck Transition Center a couple years ago. Mark, too, came with a vast amount of mechanic skills. Mark was a very positive person, and everyone enjoyed his demeanor and quick jokes. Mark commented many times in his time here on all the things we taught him, not just mechanically, but about life and responsibility. I am proud to say that today, Mark owns and operates a trucking company for himself, operating out of the Watford City area. Just another good person that needed a second chance. Thank you all for letting me share my stories. And remember, whatever it was you that needed a second chance. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And I appreciate how you shared your company story and of course your partnership with Job Service. We can't thank you enough. We are, we are grateful for your compassion, how you've addressed your workforce needs and allowing individuals who may have taken the wrong path to prove themselves again. So thanks again. Now we are pleased to have Ms. Kelly Carlson with us today to make a case for hiring individuals with criminal backgrounds. Kelly is a seasoned HR executive with over 25 years of experience. Throughout her career, she has successfully navigated the complexity of, of HR across multiple industries, demonstrating a deep understanding of the unique challenges and opportunities within each sector. Kelly is known for driving strategic initiatives that enhance organizational performance and foster positive workplace cultures, and she is passionate about making an impact in her organization and the broader community. Kelly is a certified senior HR professional and received a bachelor's degree in human resource management and a master's degree in organizational development from Concordia University, St. Paul, Minnesota. She is an active member of professional HR organizations, serves on North, the North Dakota Workforce Development Council, and regularly contributes to industry conferences and publications. Welcome, Kelly. Thanks, Phil. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us on this very important topic. And a big thank you to North Dakota Job Service for inviting us to speak today. As Phil said, I am Kelly Carlson. I get to work at True North Steel every day. And just I'm gonna make it just a shameless plug a little bit about us. True North Steel is a steel fabrication company. We also have a trucking and compliance company and we are, dip our toes into Minn Kota windows as well. We have over 800 employees in five states, 13 locations of which five are right here in North Dakota. This topic is near and dear to our hearts at True North Steel, as we are a company that was started by an immigrant from Norway, Ole Ramosmo Sr., and started our company in 1945. He came to the United States with a dream and made it a reality. Ole believed in giving all individuals second chances at the good life, and that is what we believe here at True North. 
If you ask our employees, they will tell you that working for True North Steel is just different. I believe that's because our culture is based on game changer attributes that are based on personal responsibility, being outcome focused and being a positive team player. We have found several game changers that are justice involved or have been in the past, and they have flourished with us at True North Steel. My outcome today uh, is to tell you why at True North Steel we have found that hiring individuals that are justice involved has worked for our company as well as other well-known companies. Why doing so can add to the diversity include inclusivity at your workplace and finally to review the social and economic impacts of hiring justice involved employees. DEI initiatives can enhance creativity and innovation by adding different perspectives, experiences, and ideas. A team with varied culture, educational, and professional experience can generate more unique solutions to our business challenges. We have found that being diverse, we have improved decision-making, increased employee engagement and retention, and improved customer relations with our employees because we value what employee brings to the table, not just specific groups of like individuals. So according to the National uh, Employment Law Project, or NELP, there are over 70 million Americans that have a criminal record within our country. That is an untapped labor pool to those of us in HR and employers that employers really need to rethink the possibilities. We have found that these individuals are reliable, as others have mentioned, and productive, maybe even more so than some without uh, a criminal record. Hiring these individuals can reduce recidivism, or as we've talked about, the likelihood to reoffend and promote a stable community. Successful efforts have found that we can keep individuals from going back into the prison system and becoming very successful adults. So for the benefits to employers, as many of you know, the years since the pandemic have been, been uh, proven to be very difficult to find talent. Many companies such as ours have had to get creative in finding new talent pools, as well as training employees on site instead of finding them already with those skills needed to be successful. We have found that employees we have hired that have been justice involved demonstrate high loyalty to us as the employer and are committed to staying with us because of the help we provided them when they may have been down and out following a criminal offense. Finally, we have built a reputation in many of our locations for offering stable employment with limitless possibilities by supporting rehab and, redu and reducing social stigma that often comes with having a criminal background. So some of the concerns that I've heard um, from fellow executives and owners, uh, HR folks, is that there is a question about hiring individuals uh, that are justice involved around safety and liability for our, our, their employees in our company. We review backgrounds very closely to ensure safety is in our workplace. Not every candidate that comes with a criminal background might be well suited for your workplace. Uh, however, um, how we look at how what the charge is, how long ago it happened, and what they have done since they changed the charge to improve themselves and their reliability. People that are honest about their backgrounds at the time of interview and can verbalize clear, clearly what they've learned since then and what they are committed to do to create a positive future are the employees that we want to hire. Oftentimes their performance, as I mentioned, far, far exceeds others and they're very committed to making the employment work. So uh, although I'm not an employment attorney, I have to put that out there. Uh, I want to remind you that there are some laws protecting the rights of justice involved people. First, understand not only the federal laws, but state and even local laws regarding hiring individuals with criminal backgrounds. A couple examples would be the Fair Chance Act of 2019 that pertains to federal contractors. Of course, we all know about ban the box legislations in several states and federally. Implementing fair hiring practice that comply with EEO laws. Uh, currently, the EEOC guidance to employers is that employers cannot deny employment based on criminal convictions and unless that offense is job related. As I've said, avoid blanket, bl blanket bans on hiring individuals and consider things like the nature of the crime, the time passed and job relevance to the position you're looking to hire. As always, check with your employment attorney if you have any further questions on this. 
So I want to introduce you to one of our success stories. This is our employee, Jamie Howard. Uh, unfortunately, Jamie recently had to relocate due to family circumstances, but it's a great story, so I wanted to keep it in this presentation. Jamie spent 20 years in the North Dakota State Penitentiary. We met Jamie when True North Steel did a presentation for Rough Rider Industries. Rick, uh, a speaker today, reached out to us letting us know of Jamie's story and thought he might be a great fit in our True North Steel and our Mandan location. Jamie spent over four years with us in a variety of positions. He was promoted multiple times. He learned the soft skills that Rick and Colby mentioned in the Rough Raiders program and was a great fit for us. He had hope for his future and learned that self-discipline and showing up every day was the key to his success. He was voted Game Changer of the Year, which is the picture in the uh, on the right below uh, for 2021 for our entire organization. And it has been, and it was very well deserved. He said that work ethic he learned at Rough Riders helped him be success, successful in his roles and Turner Steel and feels that being accepted at Turner Steel has changed his life. Jamie is a great example of what is possible when you give people a second chance. So, um, Implementing fair chance hiring. For companies out there that want to consider this untapped labor pool, first, I recommend you take a look at your hiring policies. Avoid being too specific on what type of backgrounds you will and won't hire. Like I said, in our policy, we, take out, we took out absolutes and said that we will consider all backgrounds with some small exceptions and base your hiring decisions on potential. I just heard this at an HR event I attended a couple weeks ago. Don't hire for past, hire for potential. Uh, next, make sure that you're training your hiring managers on that policy and what is looked for and considered for a hire at your company. We have found that support and integration is key in making sure this partnership is positive for both the new employee and our company. So I know I've mentioned a lot about True North Steel today. Um, we have been very successful, but it's no secret that today's employees want to work for a company that values diversity, equity, inclusion, or DEI. Uh, Starbucks, Starbucks and JP Morgan have embraced DEI initiatives and fostered an inclusive environment that includes justice involved employees. They have called it fair chance hiring and have said that 90% of their fair chance talent works hard and they even go above and beyond at work. 87% have been promoted for their job performance and 85% say that retention is higher because those employees tend to stay with companies that give them a second ch chance. All right, so call to action today. As I mentioned, review and update your hiring policies. Um, advocate for inclusive hiring practices. That's just good D&I procedures. And understand the importance of a second chance. Again, I'm not saying that businesses should hire every applicant with a criminal record, but instead provide them with the right to be fairly assessed for the role that they are applying. So in conclusion, I would highly recommend taking a look at your current practices and making a strategic decision to hiring all types of employees into your businesses. Studies have shown that companies with diverse workforce tend to outperform their companies, their competitors financially. For instance, McKinsey research has shown that ethnically diverse companies are 35% more likely to outperform less diverse competitors. By appealing to a broader audience, diverse companies could expand their market share and their customer base. As we have said, diversity in the workforce promotes uh, creativity, drives better decision making, enhances employee satisfaction, and positively impacts financial performance. Now, I can't wait for you to meet our next speaker, our very own Molly Thies, who works at Turner Steel and has an impactful story to share. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. You have provided some great information, and we agree that hiring individuals with criminal backgrounds is a, is a strategic decision that benefits both business and community. Now, our next speaker is a courageous individual who is here to share her own story about life after incarceration and how she learned from her experience to help others. Molly Tice was a marketing and communications director at several nonprofit organizations before taking a position as the marketing and public relations director for Community Memorial Hospital, and then she started her own consulting business. Through a series of life-altering circumstances, she developed a drug addiction that led to her being incarcerated in a Minnesota state prison for four years. Upon her release, 
Molly struggled to find a job until she was hired at a furniture manufacturer and developed a new career path for herself. During her 10 years working as that company's production planner, she helped create Solid Start, an initiative that focused not only on hiring, but helping justice-involved individuals establish new careers, while at the same time improving that company's production capacity. In 2023, she accepted a position as a production planner and scheduler at True North Steel in Fargo, where she is currently employed. Molly advocates for both business and the formerly incarcerated through her storytelling and local churches, community, and industry groups. Molly was appointed in 2020 to the advisory board for Rough Rider Industries by Governor Bergen. She was reappointed in 2024 for another four-year term. Welcome to the stage, Molly. Thank you, Phil, and I want to thank Job Service of North Dakota for inviting me to participate in today's webinar, Breaking Barriers. It's an important topic because it's about how we strengthen individuals rebuild families and improve our communities. And I was asked today to share my personal story, my journey, and to tell you about a workplace initiative um, that I helped create in my previous job. And I wanna start by saying I'm very blessed. My journey has taught me a lot. The things I've been through, the obstacles I've overcome have helped me grow into the person I am today. And by sharing my story, it's my greatest hope that I can touch others and affect change in their lives. And I want you to know that my story is not unique. There are thousands of stories of addiction that are filled with hope and lots of success here in North Dakota. I was always a good kid. I was smart, outgoing, a good athlete, a leader, and an overachiever. I skipped the third grade. My team won the state basketball championship. I was president of student council and a straight A student. My dad was a sheet metal worker and a foreman. My mom was shy and secure. And there's a few things that happened in my childhood that my parents just couldn't handle. So I had to deal with these things alone and tried to bury them, but I was very damaged. After high school, I went to college on a scholarship, but I had trouble coping and I dropped out. I got lost in the 1980s decade of decadence, and I lived in hotels and on tour buses. I was a party girl, hanging out with musicians and doing cocaine. But then in 1987, I got pregnant, and so I quit the party life, I left the road, I found a job, an apartment and I went back to school working hard to earn a college education so I could support myself and my son and build a better future for us both. My career was absolutely amazing. I climbed that proverbial corporate ladder. I got married. I had three more sons. I bought my dream home. My backyard was behind a state park. I, in addition to my job as the marketing director at the hospital, I was a published writer. I coached my son's basketball team. And I was always there working in the snack stands for all their baseball games. Then a back injury introduced me to pain pills. These took away not just the physical, but the emotional pain I carried, just like cocaine did for me more than 20 years before. I developed a reliance on them. After I had surgery, I needed something to replace them and was introduced to meth. I was immediately addicted. I didn't know what happened and I was over my head. I left my job. I left my career. I left my home and I left my children. I moved to the Twin Cities and then to Fargo, always chasing the high, wanted desperately to forget the past and get lost in addiction. I lost myself when I wasn't even a person anymore. I became the property of a guy who was a member of a bike club. He introduced me to meth and supplied me with the drug I needed. He also abused me mentally and physically. He raped me, he beat me, and once locked me inside of a trunk for nearly two days. I did get free of them, but I was still an addict and I was still very broken. I was in, in and out of jail a lot. I lived on people's couches and I lived on the street. I couldn't bear seeing my kids and letting them see what I'd become, so I just stayed away. Things got a little better after a few years and I got married to a man who was good and kind, but he was an addict too. We both held jobs, but we were dealing drugs on the side to pay for our habit. And in 2009, we were addressed arrested on major drug charges. I was sentenced to serve 10 years in a Minnesota state prison. To make a very long story short, first I took complete responsibility for my actions and all my mistakes, and I found myself again. I gained the strength to walk away from drugs and I was determined to make amends. In prison, I worked hard to overcome challenges of being in prison, sidestepping the violence, avoiding the evil, enduring the punishments, surviving the lost time, and all those missed experiences, including the birth of my first grandchild. And I did earn an early release in December of 2013. I left prison alone. My parents had long disowned me. 
I left my kids and I tried to reconnect when I was inside, but they weren't interested and I couldn't blame them. Uh, my husband had gotten out before I did and he moved on. So we divorced after I got out and I went to a halfway house. So here I was back in this community, back in the community where just four years earlier, I left in handcuffs and shackles in the back of a police car. They called me a drug addict, a worthless junkie, a criminal and a danger to society. And now they were sending me back. What do I do? How can I do this? I remember going into a Walmart for the first time after so many years and the situation was more than I could handle. People were walking around freely, bumping into each other. There were sounds, noises, chaos, and it was too much. So I ran out. I didn't belong here. I didn't belong anywhere. And I thought about giving up, but I didn't. Um, instead, I took things one day at a time. First things first, I needed to have a job. I had to support myself, but this wasn't easy. 12 years ago, job applications had that little box that said felony and I was released on a condition called intensive supervised release, which meant I had to call in every day with a schedule of times and locations where I'd be. And it also meant I had 30 days to find a job or face returning to prison to serve out the remainder of my sentence. I applied at hundreds of places, from manufacturers to restaurants and everything in between. I finally got hired at a gas, that gas station for $8 an hour where I made the donuts. My shift was 3.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. I didn't have a vehicle, so I had to walk, and it was January. It wasn't enough money to live on, but while I was working at, living at the halfway house, it was a start. And from working there, I saved enough money to buy a $400 rusted old van, and I kept applying for jobs, looking everywhere in the Fork, Fargo and Moorhead area, and I was desperate to find a job where I could make enough money that I could actually support myself. Excuse me. Two quick stories. Um, one job opening was at a sandwich shop. And it was for a customer service worker. And I was one of five people called into an interview for four open positions. The manager was running late, so I had time to visit with the other applicants. Two were high school students who really didn't want to work, but their parents told them they need to find a job. One was a guy who was fired from his last two jobs for missing work and always late, but he needed to keep applying to continue to get his unemployment benefits. And the fourth was a woman who said, that she didn't like people and she asked me not to talk to her. And I was the only one of those five people not to get a job offer. And there were countless no's and we'll call yes and we don't have time for you. But then I went to a large company's hiring event. They gave me an aptitude test and a skills test, which I aced and I got an interview. And even though I explained to the guy interviewing me that I had a felony and he still gave me a conditional job offer. But then a few days later, I got the letter from the HR department and I wasn't surprised saying, sorry, we're resending the job offer due to your criminal background. But I was motivated and determined. And I went to my next interview at a business called Solid Comfort. And that day, something made me change my approach. Instead of saying, waiting to be asked about my felony, I laid it all out there. I said, I've never built furniture. I've never used a hammer or tape measure, but I think I can learn how to read it. I'm smart, I'm a fast learner, I'm a hard worker, I'm highly motivated and I'll be here every day. I'll do my best if you just give me a chance. And the plant manager said to me, when can you start? So I started in an entry level position running a machine called a castle drill. That's a picture of me running it. <laughs> and then um, I loved it and I asked if I could learn another machine and they taught me another machine and then they taught me another CNC. At the same time I was working there, I was speaking at meetings in churches, at support groups, and telling people about my journey and what was working for me. And in my presentation, I always talked about what a great job I had. And afterwards, I'd have people come up to me and say, hey, could I get a job there too? And although I couldn't promise anyone a job, of course, our plant manager said he'd interview everybody I sent his way. He did hire a lot of them and most of them worked out great. A few didn't, but the results all, overall were really good. So after working there nine months, an opening came for a production assistant and the plant manager told me I had the skills and I'd be great. And then he asked me, he said, are there any more like you? We've had great luck hiring uh, you and others. And I think we're doing something big here. Maybe we should make it official. So we started what we called the second chance program. And then a few years later, it all came together when a new HR manager um, was hired there and she tied it all together and we evolved, into, we evolved it into the Solid Start Initiative. 
So I did take that production assistant job. And two years later, I got promoted to be a production scheduler. A year after that, I was promoted again to the production planner. And when the owner of the company needed a CNC programmer, instead of trying to hire an educated, experienced candidate, he invested in me. And he provided me with all the education and sent me for training. And added, I added that to my job title as well. So now I want to share some information about Solid Start. The Solid Start initiative was a philosophy of how we recruited and hired employees. We didn't eliminate candidates because of past mistakes, and we took chances on people that had obstacles finding employment. This photo is our first second chance committee. North Dakota had a really tight labor market, and we needed to think outside the box. For our company to grow, we needed to increase production, and to increase production, we needed more people. There were challenges. At first, I was hesitant to even let my coworker tell my coworkers my last name because I didn't want them to look me up, see my criminal history. My greatest fear was that they'd find out about my past. But that changed click quickly at that job because once you were hired, you were family and you were treated equally. There was no uh, unconscious bias and I didn't feel any judgment. Slide three. When we started this as a second chance program, we needed more than me just speaking at churches and meetings and going into the jails. So we came up with a targeted marketing plan. We went to halfway houses, we went to recovery centers, we went to job fairs and not just me, but our HR director came with me. We held an open house and we invited parole officers, probation officers, case workers, and drug court judges. We had a lunch and we gave them a tour and we showed them um, what we did there and they saw people they knew working there and improving their lives, rebuilding things they lost. And we offered them more than just a job, but a hope to reunite their family and build a better future. So we developed guidelines for hiring that included a rubric, which is basically an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and I took into consideration some of the things Kelly talked about, how long ago and what crimes and that kind of thing. And we did this so we ensured that everyone was treated fairly. But then we also looked for key concepts in interviews. Words like taking responsibility for their past actions, integrity being important to them, and motivation, really wanting to uh, change their lives. And we listened to their story, if they had a story, and uh, were willing to share it with us. So next, we created a supportive environment, which is very important. We involved a lot of team members. You saw our first committee. We had... Um, uh, grown our committee a couple of different times. We educated our production leads, people that were working with um, the formerly incarcerated or people in recovery. And we had monthly meetings we called Lunch and Learns and we had POs come and we had caseworkers come and they learned a little bit about um, where they came from and what they needed. We did check-ins and we called them flybys. How are you doing today? Everything going good? Um, a lot of them like to talk about, you know, great uh, celebrations that were happening. And what do people need? that are just coming out of the justice system they get their first apartment they have nothing so i used to go around asking everybody do you have a toaster do you have a frying pan does anybody know somebody who has a small bed for a child and uh one of our volunteers on the committee turned it into doc five we took an unused semi that was in our back lot and we put in things that people would donate everybody has extra set of knives or everybody has some extra sheets or towels they don't use we put everything in there and then when people got an apartment we said go on in and find what you need it worked great and then we celebrated wins uh, we had monthly production meetings and people would get their chips for recovery or we'd have cake and cookies when someone got their license back or bought their first car and we even went to somebody's drug court graduation once um, there was a group of us cheering them on. As a company, we had a policy that allowed people off for court appointments, even if they didn't have PTO. We allowed uh, probation and parole officers to come meet with their clients at work to do work checks so they didn't have to worry about leaving work, getting back and forth, and, and they'd do drug tests if they needed to. And we had a release of information option. And this was uh, completely uh, up to the employee if they wanted to, but it just helped because then the uh, whoever their supervisor was could call and ask how they were doing and we could tell them. And if there was something wrong, if they weren't showing up for work, then we could also make that first phone call. Um, the results from 2014 to 2020 were amazing. We filled our job openings, we increased our production capacity, we increased our output, and the company went from an annual revenue of $12 million to $19 million in just four years. 
some of the benefits beyond just hiring one good employee is referrals. Um, like I said, I referred uh, quite a few people and every person that was there might know somebody that also is looking for a second chance and has the motivation to change. So it was an informal support system we had there, a different motivation and like Kelly and also the gentleman from Harlow said, uh, there's an extreme loyalty there, that chance. In 2020, the Governor and First Lady of North Dakota, Doug and Catherine Burgum, presented us with the Phoenix Award at, our, at their annual Recovery Reinvented event. It was a huge honor, and the First Lady also visited our shop and toured and met our team members. We shared our story at the Recovery Reinvented, attended by more than 2,500 people. So we learned several key components to being successful as a company that employs justice-involved individuals, starting with support from the top, um, and buy-in from the leadership team. We know, we learned it's important to demonstrate that support by attending and participating in activities, fundraisers, events, by openly standing behind it, like Kelly also talked about today. And then um, by being a member of the community, it's really important to people that were justice involved that they give back. I mean, it's just a kind of a, a thing that you wanna help others that helped you. So whether it was doing inventory for United Way or going to recovery event, um, it's been a big part of my life and I think it's a big part of everybody's life that had once been there. So the world is changing and that's a good thing. That felony box is gone here in North Dakota at least. And I worked at that company for 10 years, but it was time for me to move on. My HR manager and my boss both told me to get out of my comfort zone. It's been 10 years, you know, you should advance your career. You've got so much potential. Uh, so take a look what's out there and I did. Um, so when I decided to do that, I saw the posting for True North Steel. And the minute I did, I knew in my heart and soul that it was the right move for me. Because a few years earlier, when Governor Burgum appointed me to the North Dakota Prison Industries Advisory Board, I met the site operations manager for a True North Steel uh, location. And I deeply admired and respected him. He inspired me with stories about True North Steel and the things they were doing. And I'm proud to work at True North Steel today. It's a company that offers opportunities for people like me. And again, there's no judgment and the unconscious bias isn't there. And it's also great to see that we have national role models these days, people like the singer Jelly Roll or the actor Robert Downey Jr. who aren't judged anymore by their past addictions and mistakes who have gone on and made a success of their life and done amazing things. I'm so blessed to be able to tell you that thanks to a good finding a good job that turned into a great career, I've been drug free for 17 years. I've rebuilt my family. I have good relationships with three of my four sons um, and I won't quit trying for the fourth. And I have three grandchildren and I'm an important part of their lives. I've made great friends at my last job and I have great friends here at True North Steel. I have a beautiful home and I have peace and happiness in my life. And none of this would have been ha possible if not for someone willing to take a chance to hire me, to trust me and to believe in me. Bigger picture, I wanna say one more time that my story isn't unique. I could share dozens of similar stories about people who live in North Dakota, who went from being labeled a convict, an addict, a felon, to being your coworker, friend, and neighbor. And I'd like to remind everyone online today that it wouldn't be possible for all these lives to have been changed without there being a company, a business, or an agency, an HR representative, and a person who hires out there who says yes, and offers a job to someone like me, giving them an opportunity to earn their second chance. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Molly, for sharing your inspiring and heartfelt story with us today. I believe you have highlighted the fact that hiring justice-involved in individuals often produces benefits above and beyond adding one good employee to your team. We so appreciate you, Molly, thank you. Now I'd like to take a moment to thank the North Dakota State SHRM Council for their partnership with offering recertification credits. I'm also grateful to our speakers for their information today. I appreciate your time and efforts. A big thanks again. Now I'd also like to thank two town ladies in the background who have been running the show and promoting this event and putting up with me. Thanks, Ms. Don and Ms. Emily, you're the best. I hope you took something away from this webinar today and will join us in our effort to empower people, improve lives and inspire success. Now, I realize we are running up on the end of our time together, so you may submit questions or comments to jsnd 
underscore webinar questions at nd.gov. And again, we will provide a response and send to all of those attending today's session. For those of you who are seeking SHRM certification credit, information for today's webinar will be emailed to all who are in attendance today. Again, thank you for attending today. We appreciate your time. We encourage you to reach out to any of our job service workforce centers for information on hiring justice involved individuals. Thank you again and have a great day.